The Catholics of Oz is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to episode 82 of The Catholics of Oz. The Catholics of Oz is a show where we discuss faith, culture, and what's been happening from an Aussie perspective. Whether it's synods or science, apostolates and apps, providence or productivity, you can hear it right now on The Catholics of Oz. Hello, I'm Lindsay Sants. Welcome to episode two, uh, two, episode 82 of The Catholics of Oz. I can't add this morning. And I'm very happy to have you all here. And I am joined today by my co-host, Lido Sabol. Lido, you look fresh. You look rested. You look happy. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing very well, Lindsay. And f- yes, I'm back, guys. It's been wow, two, three weeks ago. Yeah, <laughs> it's been, it's been, 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 like a, yeah, long been a while. Yeah, it's been a bit of a while since being being back. Um, yeah, very refreshed, guys. Um, we went to Queensland for about ten days, so it was good. Um, the weather was like our spring, so it's not mm. too hot, not too cold, just perfect. Man, I can imagine going there in summer. Wow, oh, it's I can pretty hot. Yes, heat, yeah. but. It's near the beach and and a yep. lot of um other stuff to go around so to do and everything so it was good mm. it was good very good relaxing um just doing a normal you know touristy stuff you know um, snorkeling and nice um, like, you know, jet skiing you know all that sort of stuff and we just we just, just wanted to just do um, just chill and um you know apparently my my body's here <laughs> but my but my mind's still in Queensland, still in Queensland just, yeah you know, yeah it's just in a chill mode you know yeah. I'm, you know and then, but give it a couple more days guys yeah. everything will come together and go oh I'm, I'm gonna get back into the You'll groove and acclimate back into back in. being a Melbourneian. Yep. What was, the, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. what was the old uh, the old advertising slogan about Queensland? Was it beautiful one day, perfect the next? Perfect the, the next. It was. It was. Yeah. It was. Yeah. Beautiful. If you, yeah, if anyone and um any listeners and where if you want to who's um wants to go there, it's a beautiful place. Mm. It's beautiful. People are friendly and um everything is just so nice. It's and I'm sending um pictures to you guys, of course, Lindsay and yeah, Jerry we know. And, yeah, our group yeah. and yep. you know, <laughs> looking at these, you know, multi billion dollar yachts and, and oh, goodness, cruise yeah. trees, goodness me. And it's yep. like, yeah, yeah, you don't have to be, you know, too yeah. <laughs> too wealthy to live there but it's it's a very nice place in the mm. end and um yeah i i yeah we we will so for the sisters we went to wit sunday so if anyone wants to do that they can google the wit sunday so wit sundays is just a bunch of islands mm. around and we stayed at a place called um early beach where is we're in the main island where of course man queensland we stayed there for a bit then we island hopped to another island called daydream island yeah which i see yeah, it was just in a little island. You could probably walk across it in about half an hour. All oh, right, it's very small. Yeah, <laughs> it's very, very nice. small. Yeah, yeah. It's you guys. Yeah, it's yeah. a nice place just to chill and relax as well, and you know, do things. And then we came back to um early beach, and if, I mean, everyone knows about Hamilton Island, but we wanted yep. to go there, but it was so busy. Yeah, it, of course, it, it it's one so of the most totally, popular destinations. It, it? Yeah, it is. And it's around. huge. And yes, it's, yeah, that's right. That's right. And yeah. one beach was if you want to go there is called um. Whitehaven Beach, um, it is absolutely pristine. Right. Because the only way to get there is on by boat. Right. So yes, yeah. it's a lot of, it won't be open to the public so much, but it's yep. so nice. If you guys need to get there, yeah, it's nice. And I sort of s- sat there and just contemplated and, um, you know, said, said a little bit like sort of a reflection and a prayer hmm. and looked around and like, this is, can't believe this is, uh, this is the creation of God. Hmm. And also, um, it's trippy in a way that the waves are going different directions when you look at it. Yes. It's not just one wave coming to you. There's different directions of the wave and everything. And it was just un- unbelievable. And then, of course, some, when that when I was just reflecting, just quickly, I was thinking about that episode we are talking about the galaxy. Yeah. And we looked up and there's, I imagine, I'm thinking to myself, I imagine there's another place like this somewhere. Yeah, somewhere. Out yep. there in the galaxy. Yeah. It's just amazing. And, and God saw that it was good. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So I think of now when I look at all of creation, just that that phrase oh, no. always pops into my head now. 
Uh, exactly, bad. Yes. Oh, I'll talk about creation theology in a few weeks. So, in a few episodes, <laughs> I've got to queuing that up Yay. as a topic. I've got, got a few things to <laughs> share about, about that. I'm looking forward to that one later awesome, on. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, Lido. So while you and Bernadette were sending us lovely photos of your holiday, I don't want to sound bitter or anything. I don't want to sound, you know, envious. Or I know jealousy is another thing that we Catholics do. I know that. Uh, but let's just say that while you were gone, Melbourne did experience some of its coldest winter weather, and I was I've been I was about washing it. ice off my car every morning so Whoa. that I, yeah so wow, i could get there come yeah. back to that now. it was, it was wow. yeah the car was iced over yeah just so uh, well frosted anyway yeah there was one point where it was so frosty that it was uh it was kind of like pointy kind of frost how do you describe it so rather than being a sheet it was like it was elevated like sticking out like little needles <laughs> oh so, my goodness yeah. me. one morning i actually had to pull my yank my car door to get it open it was that <laughs> frosty. Be, yeah yeah that was that was goodness only one morning me. yeah but there were a couple of but mornings where i did the Get so the good old, get the man. get the bottle of yeah. water, and you know, wash the car, or, you know, get it. Of, yeah. of course, of course, of um, course, of course. I, I told Damien to turn the wipers on when I told him to, but you know that good old when they mishear you, so he turned them on straight away, and I got splashed with cold water <laughs> on my school clothes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the freezing cold. Yeah, in the freezing cold. Oh, no. Yeah. So, oh, Lena, I really no. hope you enjoyed your holiday. I hope you had a great time. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a funny thing. It was all those tourists who were coming from Melbourne and Sydney. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think everyone wanted to get out of the car. Oh, for sure they would have, yeah. <laughs> they probably had a little club where they all got together and said, I'm glad we're not in Melbourne right now. <laughs> we're not in Melbourne right well. now. I was yeah. Sydney, yeah. yeah. I was, so some people come from Adelaide as well, you know. Yeah. But, yeah, Queensland's going, yeah, come on, guys. Next, next, you guys have the next winter like that. Come over yeah. and you know bring bring some more um <laughs> profit for our economy. <laughs> yeah, it is nice. Yeah, um, Isabel and I we oh, went to gosh. Surfers Paradise for our honeymoon. We spent I yes, think we spent I four days, about four days there. So nice, it was a quick honeymoon nice. because then we had to race back because we were organizing. Um, the parish's World Youth Day 2008 in Sydney. Oh we were, my goodness! In, in the midst of getting married, wow. we were organising that too. So we were, <laughs> yeah, so it was good yeah, to have I a getaway. It was a good, good little circuit breaker yeah, for us. Yeah, circuit breaker um, for us. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, it was beautiful all the way through. It was March, I think it was end of March, start yes. of April, and it was beautiful all the yeah, way through. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So what is that? It's not, not summer, autumn, isn't it? Autumn? Yeah, autumn. Yeah, autumn yeah, over yeah. there. Yep. yep, but it's still yeah, it's yeah, still beautiful. beautiful yeah, beautiful. Yep. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Wow. Yeah, so uh, anyway, let's... <laughs> <laughs> I'll dream <laughs> about a holiday. <laughs> yeah. All right, so before we move on... Oh, by the way, we should mention Caroline's not joining us today. Um, oh, for, yes, for good yeah, reason, yeah. actually. She's... Uh, so she is with my youngest sister, Marilyn, or, you know, my and Caroline's youngest sister, Marilyn, who is getting married in October, which is very exciting. That's her October Ooh. October wedding. Pray for my sister Marilyn and, and her mm-hmm, mm-hmm, spouse mm-hmm. Jamie. They're getting married in on the twentieth of October, and uh, they're trying on all the like the bridesmaids dresses. <gasps> oh, and the bridesmaids dresses. Yeah, yeah bride. Yeah, sorry, bride, yeah bride. bridesmaids doing bride all maids. that today. So, oh, I remember that. I remember yeah, that. So, oh wow. Um, we gave Caroline special leave today because it's you know it's for a, <laughs> special it's, it's a special occasion. <laughs> so I mean you know it's all yes. part of it. You know, I can remember. I don't know if you remember this, but. <laughs> When, when Isabel and I got married and I had you and Jared and my brother Paul and I brought you guys to the, the formal shop to get suits and I don't know I don't know how they didn't kick us out because I think that was the most immaturist we've ever behaved like just we, like we, we weren't had, rude or anything we, but we were just we like rude, we were laughing just making, and joking laughing, all the way through joking it was, all yeah, along man it was, it was, like, it was so like our, our last go at being like high school kids yeah. or something you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or like 27 years old you know around that age you know oh, yeah that was hilarious <laughs> that was very so Funny. Fun. Yeah, we had a oh, lot of fun. Oh, so with that. much fun. Yeah. Well, as long as um Bernadette, I mean, it's not Bernadette. Sorry, apologies. Um, <laughs> um, Marilyn's scene doesn't turn out to be the KFC ad where they're going. Is this dress nice? Oh, of course, yeah, yeah. yeah. Choose another one. Yeah. And then, yeah, there's yeah. Not any KFC. I'll ask later. I'll ask words. later. Yeah. <laughs> Is there any KFC at this at this uh, yeah. um, dress you know tryout that you you may be doing? And yeah. That song comes out. I don't care. Yeah, yeah. I love it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> all right yeah um all right well let's move on <laughs> so caroline um yes i hope you enjoy yourself and um lino and i are going to brave through the science segment later on today whoa we'll try we'll see try. how we go we'll see how we go so before we continue if you are new to listening to the catholics of oz welcome you can subscribe to the show on apple Podcasts, google play stitcher tune in or your favorite podcast player 
Don't forget to give us a five-star rating wherever you listen and some positive feedback because it helps us to reach new people, which is what we're all about. We love the SQPN community and we love to hear um, from more of them and from new people as well. SQPN also hosts the Catholics of Oz on YouTube and as well as all of its other shows. You can subscribe there. Just search for SQPN and then hit the subscribe button. And don't forget to hit the bell to get notifications when new episodes are released because we love sharing them with you and we love hearing from you, your feedback as well. Uh, it's a, We share what we think about particular things, but we want to know what you think as well. This is a, a community show, not, a, not just a listen to what we have to say and then move on with your life. So before we uh, move on, Actually, no, let's move on. <laughs> I should get okay. Okay. Yep. Okay. Lindsay, look at your show notes properly. <laughs> so, <laughs> let's move on and talk about Faith Beyond Borders. Well, I'm actually feeling rather good about this. I think we've all arrived at a very special place, eh? Oh. Spiritually, ecumenically. How do you make somebody love you without affecting free will? <laughs> Welcome to my world, son. You come up with an answer to that one, you let me know. Yes, I had to work very hard to pass Latin and theology. Oh, quite. Those are, of course, the most important things. Oh, yeah. I'd sit this one out, Cap. I don't see how I can. These guys come from legend. They're basically gods. There's only one god, man. And I'm pretty sure he doesn't dress like that. All right, as Leto gathers himself. <laughs> 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 Sorry. That's, that's all right. Apologies. Yeah. I'm going to be um, careful you now. We, we, we can't cough and stuff. <laughs> I'm like, going to be careful. That's all. Yeah, I caught you off guard there. That's me <laughs> being not very organized. So uh, yeah, let's cool, cool. let's move on. Um, so I want to continue our discussion in Faith Beyond Borders about the Australian Catholic Church's plenary council. So uh, I've been dividing the decrees up in different ways. Now, if we go in the order that we'd normally be going in, I'd be doing the fourth decree today, which is on the dignity of men and women. However, Caroline's not here, and I really want her to be part of that one um, because there were some things about um, about women's ministry as well. So uh, I think it'd be great to hear Caroline's perspective on this particular decree. So we'll postpone that decree. It will come back. It doesn't matter. That decree was postponed in the council as well. It was the last one that was voted on, even though it was number four. Oh, wow. And I'll tell oh, the story yeah. about that later as well. But, um, but instead, we'll move on to number five and number six today. I'd like to cover those and say a couple of things about them. So the fifth decree, Lino, was about, it's called Communion in, in Grace, Sacraments of the World. And it was about participation in the church, about sacraments and the importance of sacraments as well. And then it came up with a few decrees and things that were being requested of the Vatican, which I'll get to at the very end. So I'll just provide a short summary and then we'll have a, a bit of a chat about it. But it starts by, um, by quoting Lumen Gentium, which is, the, um, which is one of the documents on the church in, uh, from the Second Vatican Council. And it says the church is like a sacrament, a sign and instrument of union with God and the unity of the whole human race. So when we think of the church, and the reason why I bring this up is because uh, I heard someone recently um, talking about the church in a conversation and um, and they were saying the church needs to do this if the church wants to attract people it needs to do that the church needs to do this the church needs to do that and referring to the church as in the leadership of the church and this was in an online conversation and I had a friend a friend from work a colleague who we had a little chat group in the background just going on and I, I wrote to my friend not criticizing this person who was having their opinion you know they were having a bit of a soapbox moment and saying the church needs to, needs to do that and whatever. And I wrote to my friend in capital letters in the background, I wrote, we are the church. <laughs> it's us. We, the baptized as well. So yeah, exactly. Know, yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Sometimes there's criticism, you know, of saying, oh, if the church wants to be more relevant, it needs to do this, it needs to do that. And I keep thinking uh, we need to keep reminding people, even our own people, what the church actually is. It's not just bishops, and priests and so on it's the baptized so so if you want to improve the church and are looking for a way to do it pray to god and then look in the mirror because god will give you your answer <laughs> and and you know and reach out to the rest of the church community anyway that's me getting on my soapbox about this guy getting on his soapbox <laughs> anyway so <laughs> i'm very passionate about the church all right so anyway because as it says here the church is a sign and when we say the church, we don't mean the buildings, we mean the people, the priests, the bishops, the baptized, and so on. It's a sign of unity with God. 
you know, you know that good old hymn, and they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Oh, wow, uh, yeah. Uh, as, oh, wow. Whatever your opinion of that hymn might be, that's I, I'm not singing its praises or whatever. What I'm saying is uh, uh, our the way we act, um, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is an outward sign of God's presence in the world, which is what the church is. It's God's presence in the world. Um, so people see what the church is like. And I, and I know I've just made all these statements. And I'm only two sentences into this whole document. So I better roll us on a little bit. But it says, we know that the church was founded by Christ and that our vocation is to be the sacrament of communion with God and the unity among all people. So that's what I just said, but in much better stated. Um, so the church's receptivity to sacramental grace, and this I think is the key thing here. This is the crux of the whole thing for me anyway. There might be others uh, with different opinions, but this is the crux of the whole document. The church's receptivity to sacramental grace deepens our spiritual connections with each other, making our visible, uh, making visible our sacramental nature. So basically, how receptive we are to the grace of God through the sacraments is how Christ-like the church will look. So when we forget that it's about Christ and we forget about our encounter with God in the sacraments, the church becomes less like Christ. When we open ourselves to the grace of God, experienced especially through the sacraments, the church is more, more like God. It is more closer to being the face of Jesus for everyone. Uh, so, so we have a choice, basically. We can make the church about God by cooperating with God's grace, or we can make it about us. And we make, if we make it about us, it's not God anymore. It's, it's, yeah, it just becomes well, another, true. it becomes any club, any non-governmental organization. It's just another player in yeah. the world. Yeah. 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 Um, but the church is more than just any other player in the world. It's not just a party or a group. The church is the visible sign of God on earth. And so we as Catholics, uh, myself included, when I say we, I, I mean myself as well, because I'm also an imperfect human being who's trying his best to be, you know, to follow God's grace in my life as well. And sometimes I get it right and sometimes I get it very wrong. But, yeah, same uh, here, same but you know, all of us, that this is the human condition, isn't it? Um, but we have a responsibility to, um, to open ourselves up as much as possible to the grace of God. How do we do that, you might say? <laughs> Turn to the sacraments. The sacraments, you know, the, you know, the, the sacraments are the expression of, in one way of Christ's uh, deepest grace for us in the church. Uh, and we have access to frequent sacraments. Remember the meaning of the sacraments you've already received. You know, Lino, you and I have married wives, so we, you know, we have been configured by our sacraments of marriage in a particular kind of way. All of us have been configured by baptism, which we experience once. Confirmation, which we experience once. You know, communion and reconciliation, which we, which we, um, which we experience frequently, which are all sacraments of healing and closeness with Christ, and all. You know, and so anyway, I could go on about this for a while, but. Um, no, 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 yeah, no, no. I really think that the, um, the grace of the sacraments, the, the, um, as it says here, our receptivity, how, how, um, how much we are willing to be receptive to the grace of God in our lives is what makes the church and Christ visible through the church in the world. Um, so it goes on to say the multicultural nature of the church community has generated a variety of liturgical and spiritual experiences for Catholics in Australia. New ecclesial, ecclesial movements and communities have also developed many faithful to rediscover the beauty of the Christian vocation. So the Australian Catholic Church Council hopes that uh, drawing on the charisms of religious orders and ecclesial movements, a rich national network might flourish, providing opportunities for Catholics to be enriched by the spiritual and mystical traditions which have nourished the church through the centuries. So reinvigorating the church's receptivity to the grace of God essentially is what it's saying here. And the variety of ways that that can happen, there isn't just one way that this can happen. There are a variety of ways and a variety of expressions in different church communities and different rites within the Catholic church uh, that, uh, that all provide a way to help people spiritually flourish. And this talks about the establishment of a national network um, that, so that people might have ways that they can experience the grace of God in their lives. So. That, uh, it goes on to quote 1 Corinthians, where it says, Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. So it goes on to say, Members of the church are diverse. Their vocations are complementary. Some are lay people. Some are in consecrated life. Some are, in orda some are ordained as deacon, priest, or bishop. Lay Catholics may be single or married. They may participate in ecclesial movements. They may be connected with religious communities. 
The church desires to foster vocations in every aspect of church life, knowing that disciples can serve Christ's uh, th- that disciples can serve Christ's mission according to their unique gifts. So essentially, if we're open to the grace of God, we will uh, we will feel the you know we will not feel maybe we will have a sense of the vocation that God is calling us to. How is God? What mission is God calling us to in our lives? And how is God equipping us through his grace to do that as well? So, and I think that's the key thing that, that we can take away from that. So openness to grace leads us to vocation. What is vocation? It is the, it's the way that we're being called to be. It's a, you know, the, the way that we're called to, to live out our baptism in the world. So it goes on to talk about priests. So through ordination, for example, priests um, who are already baptized disciples enter into a new relationship with the ecclesial community. They're called and consecrated by the church through the ministry of the bishop. They are gathered to the community. They are they are to gather the community. Sorry, proclaim the gospel and preside at the liturgy in order to sanctify the entire community of faith for its mission in the world. As disciples, ordained priests are themselves to be formed by the word and sacraments they celebrate, so that their discipleship is manifest in the way of life and in their relationships. Which, all, which also reflect the spirit of Jesus, the one who serves. So, uh, you know, priests have a special role in our church. The priesthood is a special, again, it's a um, formed through a sacrament, you know, the, order, the sacrament of ordination. Um, and they are configured to have a particular role within the, within the church community as well. And so we draw on our priests to, you know, to, to teach, to carry out the sacraments, to, um, you know, when they perform the sacraments, to be another Christ, you know, so, so priests also need to be open, like the rest of us, to, you know, to the grace of God to carry out their vocation as well. So th- this is basically defining the roles of all of us and what we do when we, um, you know, when we're open to God's grace. And so it says also that priests are formed in, in the work that they do. They're formed in their participation in the sacraments. And they're formed in the preaching of the word. So when they preach the word of God at mass, they study it as well. So that they would know what they're preaching, not just, you know, making it up off the cuff because that would be a disaster. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, yeah, and look, true. I know, I know once in a while, you know, priests have been very busy and they've had to do that and, and they get away with it. But, you know, obviously um, the, the better way is to know the scripture you're preaching, you know, to, to become expert in it and, and to teach it well. That's true. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Um, it also speaks about the diversity of the church with, um, with our link to Eastern churches as well. So um, it says that the diverse practices of prayer of the ecclesial liturgical families of the Catholic communion. So that includes the Eastern Catholic churches and the Latin church. Um, these can help build a strong, strong communities of faith to enable the active and effective participation of all the baptized to create opportunities for ongoing formation in faith and to draw all believers deeper into the mission of the gospel. So essentially to say that we, within the different rites within Catholicism, within the Eastern and, and Western churches, there are things we can learn from each other as well. Um, and this is the important thing. All, all are you know, being called by God to holiness, and, and there are different expressions of that. And again, yeah, yeah sorry, you're going to say something, Lino? I just put a quick, quick, uh, quick question. Um, yep. What do they mean by the Eastern Catholic churches? I, so, know, I know about the West, West side, Western. Yes. Yeah. Western, um, so, I mean, apart from the whole history of it all, like uh, Eastern oh, West yeah, yeah, yeah. comes, Sorry. You know, they, they, you know, there's <laughs> yeah. like geography yeah, that's yeah. related to it as well. So, you know, the, the, the Western church would be considered like, you know, the Rome, the church, um, the church which originates in Rome, the Eastern church being more sort of Eastern Europe. I'm going to try and get this right, but like uh, thinking of, um, of you know the orthodox churches where constantinople was the was the center for a while so there's this the church of the east and the west but essentially um you've got uh you've got expressions of the eastern churches within the catholic church so they're catholic in the sense that they that they um that they also um you know follow the pope in rome but their expressions are eastern they look more orthodox um and then you have the right, orthodox right, eastern right, churches right. as well who don't necessarily recognize the pope as the leader of the church but are so similar to us that that you wouldn't even realize the difference except in the expression of liturgy uh but the but the teaching the preaching the sacraments are essentially the same the devotion to mary and the saints are essentially the same um but and there are minor differences maybe i might do a faith beyond borders about this so that goes into more well, detail the history yeah. of it yeah oh well uh, yeah, time, so, yeah. <laughs> i knew to make you make make you make, yeah. do more homework Lindsay. <laughs> oh look it's a four-hour podcast all of a sudden <laughs> yeah <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. um, uh, but moving on from there, it says all members of the church are called to help Christ's church breathe with both lungs. And this is so John Paul II talked about this. The church needs to breathe with two lungs, the lungs of the East and the lungs of the West, you know, which, which, which completes the church family, um, especially the formations of its teachers in the religious education curriculum of Catholic schools. I agree. And catechetical materials, including diocese, independent, religious institute, ministerial, public juridical, da 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 da, and the list, and the list goes on with all that. Um, so the plenary council reaffirms the preeminent role of liturgical worship in the life of the church. Now, um, I uh, we went through Pope Francis's document about liturgy a few episodes back, so I won't spend a lot of time on this, but um, I'll link two ideas together. It says here, as Vatican II teaches. The liturgy is the summit towards toward which the activity of the church is directed. At the same time, it is the font from which all her powers flow. Renewal of its celebration is needed to, and this is the, the plenary council now, renewal of its celebration is needed to ensure the faithful are properly nourished at the table of the Lord's word and sacrament. And Pope Francis was saying the the mass is where salvation history, all of it is gathered into one place and we meet it. We encounter salvation history all in one place. And again, I won't spend ages talking about that because we've we've done an episode on it already. So um, the so the church is talking about uh, renewal of the celebration of the mass. It says this will be reflected in the formation of Christian faith and life, and the consequent need for a renewal of how the faith is communicated, both in the celebration of the Eucharist and in other occasions of common prayer. The way that we worship informs how we believe. Lex orandi, lex crescendi. Uh, Lex, sorry, I said that wrong. But anyway, someone else can correct me on that. Um, our, <laughs> um, our communal worship witnesses to the unity of hope in a fractured world, increasingly hostile to public acknowledgement of God. Through sacramental grace, we experience the experience of worship, the celebration of the sacraments and other rites powerfully forms us. So uh, the, I'll get to what this is calling for later, but it has to do with the language of the Mass and, and maybe some updates to the language of the Mass to make it more accessible um, because there has, I mean, there's always been, there, there are always opinions about the language of the mass and does it express what we want it to say? Um, I'm, I'm a bit agnostic on this. I, I don't have a, um, a, you know, an opinion either way. Uh, my key thing is that as, as long as the mass, whatever updates or changes, you know, we went through the updates, maybe what, Seven, what seven, 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 eight wow, years, ago, seven years ago, whatever it might be. Wow, how many years ago? That long ago when we Which, changed the. Yeah. Um, so we wow. went from you know, we went from you know changing language like uh, uh we went from I believe in... it was it the Lord be with you we used to say and also with you so we so with and we went you. to and with your spirit we say now and with your so spirit, more yeah. more spiritual language you know attributed there um okay. yeah yeah and okay. a few other theological terms like consubstantial you know in, put into the creed where instead of one in being with the father we'd say consubstantial so i i'm all for language changes as, as long as they uh, there's got to be intentionality in it as well yeah exactly yeah. so yeah, not just yeah, for the yeah, sake yeah. of it not because just, just for the sake of just changing yeah. because we want to change yeah, yeah, yeah not, there has to be a reason why for yeah, it, for, yeah for not not keeping up with change. the times or whatever but language yeah, any updates exactly. to to language is so that people can fully and actively participate in the mass which is what the second vatican council calls again is for people to to be enabled to fully and, and actively enter into their faith if the liturgy is the height if all of our energies are directed towards the liturgy as, as faithful people then the liturgy needs to be enabling for us to to experience our faith as well yeah um, exactly yeah, I think I got on my soapbox. You can tell me if I did or if I didn't. Oh, no, I'm just saying it was about the... <laughs> yeah. We it's are the like church. A, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's more like the changes, like you said, Lindsay, about mm. the, doing our prayers and everything. Yeah. You know, and it didn't... Oh, for me, it didn't take me too long to sort of be able to say it without reading it. You yes, know, if yeah. once, I think once you read it and for so many times and, and understand it and, um, you know, keep on reading it all the time... You sense to you know, um, pray it in your mind, in your heart. You know, yeah. it, it just comes, it comes naturally for us. And with that, it it, it gets more meaning. I understand that. Yeah, if it don't make change because it needs to be changed. Yeah, you know, for I don't know precise purposes, which it is. If you know what I mean, you know, yeah. you know, um, there were changes for a reason, and we all agreed upon it, and and it was working at the moment. Yeah. I don't. No, 
if yeah. anyone has anything and, about it. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, and I think uh, well, look, I don't think many people are too drastically upset with with changes like that. Uh, and I, but I think the intention, because uh, you know, one thing I noticed was that when we when we did make change, um, you know, all we got really was some prayer cards with the new words at the time and and it's like yeah good okay thanks for the prayer cards i appreciate that but all right but what's the intention behind the change as well as what you know uh, you know how how to say the new words is good thank you i appreciate that because i, I want to participate but why am i saying these new words where's the education that's coupled with it as well what you know why am i saying consubstantial with the file i know what it means i've done a bit of theology but but not everyone does uh, they might say, all right, consubstantial replaces one in being with the Father. But what does that mean? And there's an opportunity for more learning there too. You know, let's understand the nature of God. It takes away the idea that, you know, because sometimes I hear people, this is a, here's my, I'm on my soapbox, all right. One, one, thing, that, <laughs> one thing that irritates me, this, and, and, and I, I'm, I'm very polite about it when I correct people, but sometimes <laughs> okay. people will pray and they'll say, let's pray to God and Jesus. I don't know where this came from, but it became a habit for okay. some people. But it is, it is so theologically incorrect to say God and Jesus because Jesus is God. So, you know, but, no, but it creeps in. Um, you know, and maybe people say it and don't realize, but and a word like consubstantial helps us understand that. But consubstantial means nothing if you don't know what it means. You don't exactly. know what you're praying about if you don't. Anyway, I'm getting on my soapbox. But anyway, the, like getting back to where I'm going on about, the intentionality behind language changes needs to be explained, not just the language change itself. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. All right. People can write to me about that and tell me what they think. I'd, I'd really like to know. <laughs> we're on, we're yeah. on Discord, haven't we? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> put Discord. Out, yeah, let's go to Discord. Yeah, <laughs> here we yeah. go. Oh yeah, let's fire up Discord. Yeah. Um, wow. All right. Wow. Uh, now the next. This is the seventh paragraph. I'm not going to read the whole paragraph, but there are some important things in here as well, and, and I think this is important to do too. So it says here, we rejoice when Catholics come to receive the sacraments at key moments in their lives. It says the Church welcomes these opportunities for accompaniment and dialogue as we celebrate God's role in our individual and communal life. Nonetheless, the discernment process of the Council has highlighted that in Australia today, the sacramental celebrations are sometimes approached more as a cultural milestone than a moment of ongoing faith formation that yeah, unites totally us with Christ. With yes, yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Um, and it says it can be more a process of certification than incorporation. Parents and caregivers who desire for their children to be baptised often have little ongoing involvement in the life of the parish. The church needs to attend to this challenge and seek to understand better the reasons behind this lack of engagement. A parish's first responsibility to these approaches must always be to welcome and encourage what is positive in a family's request, warmly inviting them to move further on their journey towards a personal relationship with Christ lived out in the Christian community. Lino, go. What did you want to say about that one? Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I, I think it's more a cultural milestone than a faith formation that unites us with Christ and with each other you know you, you go to a baptism and, uh, and I'm not I don't know if these, these people who come to our church oh, sorry church or to our mass I, I don't I understand it's not part of our parish and maybe going from a different uh, what's it called no, from another parish and everything yeah. I don't know I just I just feel it just feels like either just doing it just, just yeah. for the sake of it, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, one thing, one thing I must, I must admit, I'm gonna admit, uh, and I know you will, um, <laughs> some of my family members will listen to his podcast, but I have to yeah. say it. Because one time I went to a, um, a what do they call it? Oh my goodness me, I'm gonna be in trouble with my sacraments. Um, not <laughs> reconciliation, <laughs> confirmation, 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 confirmation. Yeah, confirmation. What's a confirmation? No one. It just, I did not feel spiritual at this at the sure. at the mass mm. i don't know it just felt like something that had to be done and what yeah. a, what sort of bit me i mean it's not bit me yeah well annoyed me and mm. i'm not going to go on my soapbox about this as well oh it's, go on uh, get it out come uh, on <laughs> at the end of the the, the eucharist yeah after the sacraments of you know after the eucharist Everyone was talking. Mm, Everyone yeah, was yeah. having a chat. Yes, yeah, yeah. They, it's just yeah. loud. Mm. And I'm thinking, and Bernadette and I were just looking at each other and going, really? <laughs> Aren't you meant to be in yes. prayer and, yeah. and, and just yeah. thinking of what you've just received? Yeah, it's a difficult I, one, I isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I don't know, Lizzie. It's just, yeah. mm, I don't know. Yeah. But it, it, just it goes like to, thing. yeah, that, that goes to the heart of what this document is, is talking about. Because if it's just a milestone, um, 
And, you know, if it's just a, you know, as it said, just a, an act of certifications, like, you know, it could be because sometimes confirmation is seen by some people as like a coming of age. In the church, it is a coming of age. You know, you, is, are, you, 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 are, you are confirmed, you're sealed, you're responsible for your faith and your ongoing faith formation, whatever. But for some people, it's like, my kid is going to be a teenager now. <laughs> that's, that's, that's all it is. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to criticize them. Like, obviously that's not, you, you weren't doing criticizing either, but yeah, no, we, no, and, no. and what we're it's saying just... is, uh, you know, firstly, thank God they're here. You know, that TV show, thank God you're here. You know, you say, thank God you're oh, here. Yeah. Is, you know, that's, <laughs> that's good. A great show. Uh, by yes, yeah, yeah. However, but, um, yeah, I, um, it speaks to what was happening before we got to this point. Um, Father Elio Capra, who, um, who was my lecturer in sacraments years ago, uh, he's, he was big on sacraments and, um, you know, young people, sacrament formation and RCI and things like that. And he said, the, I'll try and get it right. He said, Preparing for a sacrament is a pilgrimage, not a process. Yeah. Because that's I've a good seen, point. and that's this is why um, when my son Damien prepared for sacraments, I was heavily involved. I didn't want to just hand him over to a school program. And I'm not criticizing, you know, I, I'm so grateful for the, you know, so grateful for the programs that exist and what people are doing exactly. and whatever. But yeah. the, but it's good to have is, some sort of support from the family and everything yeah. who, who who want to yeah. give you more. Yeah. yeah, but but if we took sacramental preparation a little bit more seriously, um, we wouldn't be bound by a due date. And what I mean by that is, you're doing your first communion in August, so I've got three months. You know, we've got three months to get ready for it. Um, what you would be doing is, let's walk the journey of preparing the Eucharist together. And we'll discern when is the right time for you to receive Eucharist. And it's not about, and it's not even about how much you know about it. It's not like a knowledge test, you know, like you do your preparation, you do a test and the test says, yes, you're ready. You've got 85%. Congratulations. <laughs> like driving lessons. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. yeah. Not like that. Yeah. But it's, no, it's more like, no, no. it's, it's more like uh, at least give them the dignity whether it's children or adults of, of understanding what it is that they're receiving. What um, they're receiving. You know, yeah. beyond, beyond just you're receiving Jesus and that's it. What, but what does that mean? You know, what does it mean to receive Jesus? You know, what, what about the whole St. Augustine, you are what you eat. You receive Christ in communion. You become another Christ for the world. You carry on the blessings of God in the world. And, you, you know, you are, you're a sacrament for others and you, you bring Christ, you carry out mission. Not, not that kids are going to memorize all this, but, but the point but, is yeah, through, yeah, through, through a yeah. pilgrimage, a pilgrimage is forming. And this is the thing, it's formation. A process is, today we're going to look at chapter one of the communion book. <laughs> today we're going to, today we're going to you know, and, and fill in the activities, high five each other and, and do a poster and out to go. Uh, <laughs> and I'm all for, for those things. I love posters. I love all this kind of stuff. But the formation has got to be there because we're, we're, we're doing a disservice if, 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 it's, you know, if the formation is not great. Uh, and like I said, though, parents may come in, you know, people might come into a church having not been to a church in a long time and wanting to baptize their kids. And I say, great, great, do it. I, I, I'm, I'm wholeheartedly for it. Baptize the child. Don't don't say, no, you haven't been to church in a long time. We're not baptizing the kid. Go ahead and do it. No, no, but, no, 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 no. But, you know, but, and this is where the church, I think, is moving in the right direction with the council here is saying we need better formation in these times. In these moments, we need more formation. We need better, you know, better um a better way of doing it when people come come and ask for the sacraments. Well, you know what's what's available in a parish when a, when a person says we're here for this sacrament, we're here for that one. You know what what happens. So anyway, that's a <laughs> look at us. I, I'm standing on your soapbox, Lido. <laughs> <laughs> I shall come down from yeah, that soapbox. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'll speed it up a little bit because uh, I'm getting getting bogged down a bit. But these are important reflections to have, I guess, as well. Well, isn't that's it? a bit. When you yeah. said so, so that part of it, and I was like, well, yeah, yeah, cultural. It's always like, yeah, yeah that, that's what I feel like. It's mm, yes, yeah, yeah. And, and good. The church is addressing it too. Is rec is exactly. naming it and addressing it and saying we need to do more going exactly. forward. Yeah. Uh, just just one point before yeah. before we go. We, we, was, the most embarrassing thing was mm. I think um. There was a bishop there, yeah. and he even told the people to. St <laughs> What's that? <laughs> to, to, to keep their voices down, uh, and okay, maybe yeah. subtly telling them to shut up. Yeah. Because, I'm not being mean, but th that's probably something you need to be in prayer and in, yeah. in another thing. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, and this is where, yeah, I think um, this is where where clergy, bishops, and priests they, and, and I think they have an opportunity as well to change the way that they do mass depending on who's there because you can have masses that are more educational where you do things like saying now is the priest i'm going to do this 
your role at this time is to whatever, right? Um, or um, it, at this point, you may not have seen a communion service as part of a mass before, but at this point, this is what we believe is happening in this sacrament. It's one of the most important things we do as Catholics, we believe. So you'll see the Catholics in the, in the church come up and receive communion, and they're going to pray quietly. And during this time, I invite you to dot, dot, dot. You know, dot, dot. There's, yeah, all, exactly. there's opportunities. Exactly. They're 100%. Where, you know, when you have a church full of people who have no idea why they're there, that's an opportunity to evangelize. Yeah, but that's, yeah. yeah I've seen, you know, um, when our previous father, Michael, who married me and Isabel, and you and Bernie and, and a whole bunch of other yeah. people we know, yeah. Um, father he, father so Shabalt, hello. He, yeah, but yeah, um, shout out to him. He's a wonderful man um, and priest. He, uh, he, preached the what is it the beatitudes for our wedding that was the gospel and I think the was, way yeah. he preached it the way he preached it reached to the guy who who um who drove the wedding car for us oh cool who, do, who doesn't go to church nice, and he was talking about he was telling me and isabel what he heard in the in father michael's preaching because nice. we did have people we did have people who don't go to church come to our wedding as well oh, as well as people true. who do go that to church true. So yeah, yeah, yeah. opportunities, uh, you know, that, um, for evangelization there. Um, not saying that priests don't do it. I'm sure a lot of priests do and they do it very well. But it's um, definitely, I mean, in, like you said, in those situations where everyone's talking, you know, what do you do? You, you evangelize. Go for it. Oh, that's true. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Um, now, I'm going to speed through, read through a little bit more of this. It talks about the importance of the right of Christian initiation of adults, which is, you know, adults who are entering the church and receiving the sacraments. Uh, and the, and the importance of preparation and having, uh, here it is, offer a deep, fruitful period of preparation, which is what I was just talking about. Um, it, it also has a few things to say about the Eucharist. Um, the church professes the Eucharist to be the source and summit of sacramental life, which comes from Lumen Gentium. Uh, now, I'll just get to the one part. The Plenary Council acknowledges the need for renewal in catechesis formation and devotion to this sacrament. To support this, the Australian Catholic Bishops Conference has requested that the 2028 International Eucharistic Congress take place in Australia. That'd be awesome. That'd be great. So um, basically, one of the one of the actions, apart from more formation around the Eucharist um, uh, and understanding of it, is to have the next internet. Well, the the International Eucharistic Congress, which happens in 2028, have it here in Australia. So have a big Eucharistic um, International Eucharistic renewal right here in Aussie land. So nice. that'd nice. be great. Cool. Yeah. Or for that, uh, would they do it in one one place? Were they Lindsay, or would they uh, do it? I'm, I'm all, assuming all over so. The place or do um, like a big, huge um Zoom. Yeah, <laughs> a big Zoom <laughs> session. Would, would, would well, no, people thought about it. Yeah, no, we... I've seen conferences where people are present and also join in from Zoom at the same time. So there, that's probably an opportunity for that. Yeah. Okay. We'll see. Okay. Yeah, my cool, feeling cool, is cool. it would be in Sydney because Sydney's just oh. huge. Although, I mean, well, come on, Sydney. Melbourne, you know, just saying. Come on. Yeah. Well, or maybe saying... rural diocese. I mean, that would also be something oh, pretty Oh, no, no, that's yeah. different. Yeah, yeah, why not? That'd be something Clippers. amazing. Yeah. Yep. I mean, I yeah, work yeah, in, the, I work I in the diocese that. of sale. We could do it there. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> so, <laughs> yep. um, all right, so rolling on. And also, coupled with the Eucharist, the next paragraph immediately talks about the liturgy of the Word. So the importance of the Word of God too. Uh, so, um, and the, the importance of preaching. So it says, opening up the word of God together in prayer, we invite God into our lives. In our listening and discernment, concern has been voiced about the state of preaching uh, in the church in Australia. Supporting and promoting excellent faithful preaching reflects the importance of the homily in the celebration of the Eucharist. Uh, and the Second Vatican Council has said, by means of the homily, the mysteries of the faith and the guiding principles of Christian life are expounded from the sacred text during the course of the liturgical year. So the importance of preaching the word of God. Now, it says here that concerns were raised about, you know, the preaching of the word. And I think this is avails, you know, some priests don't do a good job of preaching homilies. All right, fair enough. Let's okay, put that up there. Enough. All right, there is some yeah. truth to that. I, I'll acknowledge yeah, there's truth to that. I've, yeah. seen, okay. I've seen great okay. homilies. I've seen homilies where I won't say anything else. Um, okay. but, <laughs> but you know what? To be fair, I've also seen lay people do a really bad job of preaching scripture as well. And also a really good job. So let's let's aim our cannons at everyone who's you know uh, <laughs> okay. who's ha who's having a go and making it up on the spot. Um, whew, whew. With, with our preaching of scripture, all of us, including priests as well, and whoever anyone else who does a preaching, it needs to be it needs to connect people to the life of what's going on. What, what is God saying to us through this? And, and that comes from a knowledge of scripture as well. And it's good when people sincerely do their best. We all get it wrong from time to time. It's, uh, you know, but the thing is, uh, we need to also watch out for preaching, I think, and I've seen examples of this too, which, which suddenly becomes a political discourse rather than a, 
you know, I, I remember going to a mass once with Caroline and, um, and after the mass, I said to Caroline, so what was the gospel about? Because the gospel wasn't preached. Yeah. So it yeah. was, it was, um, it was political social Something nonsense. Else. Yeah. And, oh, gosh, and that's unfair to the laity. Yeah. So I, I throw that, but, but having said that there are lay people who couple scripture with politics as well. And they, and again, the presence of God diminishes and the presence of politics comes to the front and that that's not our Christian mission at all. Uh, you know, say, um, yeah, I, I, I just don't see that as that having place in liturgy and let's restore the place of the word of God to it, to its elevated place because the, the Eucharist is enhanced by the preaching of the word of God in the homily that they, 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 they go hand in hand. They're not two separate things. We don't go to mass just for the Eucharist. Uh, we go, the, the, we go, we for do the whole, prepare. It's the whole picture. It's the whole mass. And, yeah, and we are prepared and mass. deepened and, and, and whatever else by our encounter with God in scripture, because scripture I've done, I've said this before at the start of the year in one of our podcasts, God is talking to us through scripture. God has something to say to us there and then in that moment. And that enhances our experience of Eucharist. God has said this, and then God, you know, God has spoken to us. God has entered us through the Eucharist and now armed with what we've received from scripture and, uh, and changed and, and developed and renewed in our communion with God through, through, you know, through Eucharist, we now go out into the world and continue our baptized mission. I've done a lot, exactly. of, a lot of soapboxing today. I'm so sorry about this. <laughs> I just, yeah. we'll, we'll probably not put the title for our podcast. Soapbox. soapbox. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Episode soapbox. 82, Soapbox. <laughs> soapbox. <laughs> Get off Look, your soapbox. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I totally understand. You know, I, you know some of the um, priests we've, I'm uh, sorry, and churches we've gone to, and ma- sorry, masses, masses, not churches, but masses we've gone to, and some of the priests who do homilies, and what's the other one, Lindsay? Oh my goodness, I'm so bad. Homilies, and there's another one. What's that? Um, uh, when I do a homily, but then there's another one called when I do something different than a homily. Oh my gosh, like a reflection. So bad. Reflection, yeah, yeah, yeah. The reflection. Yeah. I was something, and then it, it's nothing. Yeah, like you said, it's nothing got to do with the um the gospel reading of that day. Oh, of course, talk of course, about, yeah. And they talk about maybe something that has happened yeah. in the media, and they go, oh, whoa, 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 mm. whoa, okay, settle down. We don't want that at the moment. We yeah. want to what what the meaning of the gospel is for yeah. us. When you tie when you tie current events together, that's okay. So our last Father Michael, our last Father Michael, because he was our parish priest throughout the whole COVID situation. So he was preaching the gospel and linking it into there. And, and what, is, you know, okay. what is this context yeah. calling us to do in light of the scripture? That's fine. But not when scripture is absent from the homily altogether and it becomes exactly. uh, anyone could do yeah. it if that's the case. Yeah, Exactly. Yeah. yeah. yeah it's just like sometimes it just goes a bit, a bit tangent in the sense of in the way yes, they go yeah, yeah. different way. Yeah. And they go, whoa, 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 we're going to mm. come back to the... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> to your homily about the scripture of the day. Yeah. Um, you know, and but about the life, all, all our lives. I understand that. I understand yeah. that. Yeah. All right. So um, the last three paragraphs, I'll just whip through the themes of these. So one is about, I talked about the language of the liturgy, so I'll leave that. Um, it just it um, basically talks about translations of prayer and scripture passages for use in liturgy needs to be faithful to the original text, sensitive to the call for language that communicates clearly and includes everyone in the assembly. Um, now it says here, the people of God in Australia have voiced a desire to be formed in the sacrament of reconciliation. Some have advocated for the use of the third form of the rite of penance. Now, this is a topic of its own. Oh, we spend a lot of time I know, on this. I was about to say, topic what is that, the third form? So yeah. the, third, the third rite is where... Oh, very, um, very quickly, Lizzie. I'm sorry, yeah, man. So, but, but it's the one, to, yeah. it's the, it's the yeah. group one. It's, uh, so my understanding, I'm, I'm a bit vague on this one because I haven't experienced it often. Um, so it can be used in different contexts. So the, the most common thing that's said is it can be used in emergency situations. So you're on a plane, the plane's about to crash and oh, you haven't got time to right. do everyone's reconciliation yes, together. Sorry. So you do it as a yes. group thing. Um, but I've also, I've also seen it used um, in where you have special like sacraments of reconciliation, like evenings or nights, if you know what I mean, um, where you've got like five or six priests doing, doing them at once. And they'll start with a short prayer service and they'll do the third rite. So they lead you through an examination of conscience and, you know, you're sorry for you express sorry for your sins in prayer and so on. Um, and, and then what they say is if you have sins that are, you know, we would classically call it mortal sin, right? If you have sins that are really deep, you know, really, if they're pretty serious, then go and see a priest in confession 
uh, you know, one on one. However, if your sins are venial, which is kind of like your everyday, like, you know, whatever, just think of something like I had a bad thought about a person, whatever, I don't know, whatever it might be. Oh, okay. Um, well, so you stealing, know, oh, no, yeah, stealing, uh, something stealing different. gets a bit serious, I reckon, depending on. Oh, okay, the, sorry. You know, <laughs> yeah, sorry. You know, okay. Well, yeah. well, well, well. Anyway, that, there's, yeah. all, there's all kinds of things. Anyway, um, in which case you can say a few prayers and go home if you don't, you know, um, whatever it might be. But, um, but they're talking about the expansion of the third right. I, I don't necessarily understand the context of this yet, but I guess that will become clearer later on. So someone who's an expert can expand that for me. Uh, and then it talks about the sacrament of marriage as well. So including in, in this thing about sacraments, um, there is this sort of in modern society, marriage is starting to be seen as a bit outdated and irrelevant. Oh and my says, goodness me. Yeah. Um, but well, it says, I was, <laughs> well, I mean, we have shows like Married at First Sight on TV, oh right? So I mean, I that, that say, says all of it, right? And that says all, all of it. Yeah. It's all about the... You know, the gimmick, you Media, know, the gimmicky kind of the thing. Entertainment, yeah. the gimmicky, all that stuff. Yeah. That, that those are the things yeah. that make yeah that romantic comedy marriage, kind marriage. of perceptions of love rather than the rather than what the, the depth of, of marriage is as a sacrament. Marriage is really yeah. means. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah, anyway, it says here yeah. um, there's an urgent and clear need for renewed catechesis on marriage. Agreed. And and one thing I would say is uh, um if I were talking about this, my contribution would be I think that marriage formation needs to continue after a couple is married as well not just before. So you might do a program to get married, whatever it might be. Um, you and I with, with Bernadette and Isabel, we did that three day course, I think it was, or a weekend course, which was good. It got the ball rolling, which is great. Got you to have some serious conversations outside of those meetings, which was good. Yes. Yeah. Like, um, I hopefully I did say a few good things. Yeah. I'll probably. Yeah. Do. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, awesome. But then, um, yeah. What about afterwards? Uh, I mean, does, do you have to go searching and opt in and find something somewhere or, or, does the church, you know, I mean, do, where are the opportunities? And again, I said the church, you know, we are the church. Yeah. So, uh, exactly. you know, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I guess opportunities that are supported by um, structures within the church. So a structural thing that's part of the, the church life, not just a voluntary, let's start a marriage ministry, but something that's actually within the, the church's structure that then offers ongoing formation because marriage is lifelong. <laughs> you know, we, we, when we get married in a church, we're like, hey, I'm doing this you know, forever. I've, that's what I've committed to. Um, you know, other circumstances aside, that's a different issue altogether. But essentially, that's what the, what the sacrament's all about. But the thing is, your marriage changes when you have kids. Your marriage changes when a spouse gets sick. Your marriage changes when, you're, when you experience financial hardships together. You know, your, your marriage changes dot, dot, dot. So, so the formation um, of supporting that, um, supporting, I guess, the prayer life of married couples as well uh, and supporting married couples, you know, if they have kids in how they, they can form their kids. There's, there's so many opportunities there too in, in terms of ministries that can exist. Um, anyway, so uh, essentially the, the proposal, proposal decrees are the following. Just very quickly, so it says uh, that the diocese promotes uh, the diocese that diocese promotes the exercise of formation uh, for the ministers of lector, acolyte, and catechist. Great, uh, that in the light of changed in circumstance over the past twenty years, the Australian Catholic Bishop Conference review the provisions and guidelines it issued in May two thousand three for lay people to participate in formal ministry of preaching in the Latin Church as provided in Canon 766 of the Code of Canon Law. So I think this relates to lay people being able to preach and sometimes possibly even at Mass. So this one's okay. going to be a contentious one that people might get grumpy wow. about. So at the yeah, moment... I can yeah. see that. Yeah, yeah I, at the I'm moment... Not a bad thing. Yeah, no, not, not a bad, bad thing. thing. No, that, no. Yeah, the, the, yeah. Um, the provision at the moment, I think, is that yeah, if a priest is not feeling too great or is a bit old or infirmed or whatever, uh, a lay person can come up and give a reflection on the gospel. So this is saying, um, can we update that so that it's a full preaching? If you've got a well-formed layperson who knows their faith and maybe consults with a priest or consults with whoever is at the church, they could preach a homily. Yeah, that, that's fine. Um, yeah, but there's there's a few more things, I guess, that need to be discerned in that process. So the ball okay, is rolling yeah. there with that uh, and true. what it might mean. That is true. Um, that, that, the is bishops, true. Yeah, that the Bishops Commission Institute, a sustained program of catechesis of the sacrament of penance to promote an understanding of the conditions for an appropriate practice of all three forms of the rite of penance. So that will include the first rite, second rite, and third rite of penance. Um, and then Article 4, that the Plenary Council requests the Holy Father consider whether the third form of the rite of penance might have a wider use on occasions where it's particularly appropriate, granted an understanding among the faithful of its distinctive nature and requirements. So an expansion of the third form of, of confession 
as long as it's understood why people, you know, why people are there. So it's got to be explained pretty well and there's got to be reasons. So there's got to be reasons for the circumstances of its use in, in other areas. So, uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm. So that's the, the fifth one. Um, you know what? I might just leave the sixth one till next episode, looking at how long it's taken to get through this one. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I did promise I'll look at the sixth one, but I'll do a, a short one on the sixth um, decree in our next episode. Okay, so, um, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, let's let's move it on, Lino, because we're almost at an hour now. And <laughs> wow, we still we had, had to talk. Discussion. Yeah. All right, yeah, we so, had a good discussion about yeah, this. Yeah, it was a good discussion. Yeah, it was good. Yeah. And we yeah. invite other people to contribute as well. We want to hear what you have yes, to say. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah. we'd we'll like to hear, hear your comments, guys, and you mm. know, about how this is going through. But, um, yeah, it's. Uh, sorry, when you were talking about this, Lisa, that was the first thing. Yep, I need to talk about this. Yep, I need yeah, to talk about this. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> for sure. And that's what the about. And just, you know. Yeah. yeah, there's important discernment when we talk about things like lay preaching, expansion of um, you know, the third right of of, um, of confession or reconciliation. Uh, you know, like we said, ministry towards married people, the importance of Eucharist, the importance of sacramental preparation, all that stuff that we just spoke about. So, um, would you yeah. do a homily, Lindsay? It was you're definitely um, qualified to do a homily if Father. Prince is not too well. Would you? Would you be able to go there? Uh, if I, uh, <laughs> I don't know. put it in my spot. <laughs> uh, let's 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 put it this way. Right? It's not about if the circumstances were there, right? Okay. okay. Where yeah. where <laughs> something happened and the church was on fire and there was no other, there was not no one else to <laughs> okay. do it. Like basically, I would do a homily if the church was empty and there because we ran out of people who could do it. You know. Um, no. If if um if look. Not because I would want the opportunity to do it, right? Not because it's about me. If there was a circumstance where lay people could preach a homily in mass and the circumstances were right and the priest wanted it, then, then yes, I would do it in consultation with the priest though. Um, uh, however, however, a lot of things have to happen. A lot of circumstances need to come out before I'd even consider it. Um, I, do, I do lay preaching at school. Uh, um, so, for example, um, when we have our retreats, we have um, a, a liturgy on, on, you know, on the second night of the retreat, which includes prayer. It includes scripture as well. So I do a five to seven minute preaching on, on what the scripture is about and how it applies to exactly. their lives. It's yeah, not a homily. You can't be called a homily because it's not within liturgy, but it is. It yeah, shares yeah, the characteristics of a homily. Char- characteristics you know, yeah. of a homily. Yeah, um, I understand that. I understand yeah. that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, would I preach a homily? I'm not looking for the opportunity i'm not like yes i can't wait to preach a homily you know but if um, <laughs> okay. if if, if okay. it was within if it was within the mission of the church if this is what we discern that god is calling for and if um and if my parish priest asked me to do it then then the answer would be yes of course yeah um for sure but again there'd, there'd have to be all kinds of reasons why that was the right thing to do in that situation and yeah. that's what they're talking about, isn't it, Lindsay? For uh, I think so. That, um, in a sense, but yeah, then, I think so. Mm. Yeah, I, I'm all for lay preaching of the word. Um, you know, in in all kinds of circumstances, I think we do need more uh, more lay preachers, better lay, pre- more more equipped lay preachers. I've heard some wonderful people who who are lay who preach scripture, who know what they're talking about, and have been very very inspiring, and very prophetic and very insightful. Um, that that's all great. Um, I'll let someone else have the liturgy war over whether a lay preacher in church is appropriate yeah. or not. Yeah. I, I think I, I can see reasons for it happening. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to say no, don't, don't do it ever. Um, you know, but, you know, but I think there are reasons where it could happen. Uh, but it's got to be discerned very carefully about why we, you know. Yeah, I was about that, to say, yeah. I think it's probably best to it, yeah. go through, yeah, I, you know, before yeah. you know you're going to do that, um, yeah. homily, go through yeah. the, go through the, the, mm. the priest first and say, like, I uh, want to talk about this yeah. or talking about the scripture in this way. You know, yeah. there has to be uh, a structure in a sense here. Yeah? yeah. As I started this segment, again, it's it's not about the person. It's about Christ. It's about uh, us being open to the grace of God so that the okay. church looks more Christ-like. So anything that makes the church look more Christ-like, I'm open to. It's up to someone else to discern if that particular move makes the church more Christ-like. And that's, and that's my great cop-out. There you go. <laughs> 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 okay so with that in mind let's move on Lido, and let's talk about science ah, what a fine day for science you have any hobbies i collect spores molds and fungus can you reverse the polarity i'll do my best Okay. 
excited. Today, I'm very excited about this science segment because while I'm not necessarily good at explaining explaining things that are very sciencey, I'm very excited uh, because at the it'll be on the day or the day after this episode releases. So, I mean, everyone who's listening tomorrow, you're basically. Tomorrow. <laughs> Yeah, right. really weird. Uh, isn't or, it? Yeah. or today, it's oh, going to be one or the other. <laughs> wow. Or maybe okay. even while you're listening. <laughs> wow. NASA. This is going cr- yeah. NASA is going to launch the Artemis 1 mission. It is going to officially kick off uh, the Artemis program. So the Artemis program has actually been running for a while, but the first mission of the Artemis program is, is going to literally launch. And this is very, very, very exciting. So, Lena, I'll give us a, a very quick breakdown. Um, this is all from NASA, and I've put links to all these things um, in our show notes. So, uh, NASA has provided an, an overview um, of, of the mission going to the moon. Uh, it's provided a breakdown of the different satellites it's launching along the way. There's an awesome infographic. So, it's got pictures with diagrams showing each stage with what's going to happen. And they've also made a video that goes for about 10 minutes, which is really good. Um, the video goes into a lot of detail about the details around the mission too. So um, I'll just uh, I'll just give a bit of an overview of what's actually happening in this mission. Artemis is uh, in in uh, Greek mythological you know legends. Artemis is the sister of Apollo. So the the I first, remember that yeah. yeah. So the, <laughs> the moon the first moon missions were was the Apollo program. Um, yeah. And they used the the Saturn V rockets, which was this huge monster of a rocket. It's just amazing. Um, and there's a documentary I, I recommend. It's like a documentary film called, I think it's just called Apollo or the Apollo missions. Um, and it it basically they take the footage um, and they uh, of the Apollo mission and they fix it up and make it look really good for mod, you know for modern viewers. And you just basically follow the entire mission. It's cut down. It's not three days long. Obviously, it's about it's an hour. It's about two <laughs> oh, yeah. hours long. But I was. Oh man, I've I've talked about it before in, in last year, I think it was. I was stunned. I loved the documentary so much that I watched it one night and I watched it immediately again the second day, like the day oh, after. Wow. Uh, the, okay. the launch sequence, just the launch sequence alone is stunning. The way they do it and the music they put over the top, it's it's beautiful. So I hope someone does this for Artemis. So that's what I'm saying. That's that's what I'm really getting at. <laughs> yeah. So, so what's what what's yeah. the one with Tom Hanks? What Apollo mission? Apollo was that? 13. Because Apollo eleven went to the moon. First, yeah. So I, th- I think the film was Apollo thirteen, which right, took a lot of dramatic right. license, but it's still a very cool film. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I understand. Yeah. That was a different Apollo. Okay. Yeah, good old sorry, Houston, sorry. we have a problem. Yeah. That was the line, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. When they say that, whew, that's really, really. <laughs> yeah. Intense. Yeah, uh, but I mean, having had that problem and working, workshopping a way to get these guys back to Earth, it I mean, was whoa, incredible. Yeah, that was yeah. incredible. <laughs> Despite whatever the film tells us, I'm sure the work behind the scenes in real life was also Oof. incredible too. Yeah, I would. I would be have so much stress trying to get those. Oh, ash- ash- oh for back sure. Home. You're trying to get oh. people, you know, human beings back to Earth. I mean, they're trapped in space. There's no rescue. You can't send anything up there to bring them back. So no. Oh. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. So Artemis. Um. So this is now the renewal of of going to the moon, and this is more long term. So the Apollo missions collected samples and studied the moon and left instruments there and so on. This is really about um about moving towards a more permanent human presence on the moon and then also about because artemis really its goal is deep space exploration so from from the moon to mars and beyond into into the rest of our solar system so we're talking about a very 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 long-term uh, mission which will develop and grow over time and the first vehicle that's part of this is the sls or the space launch system um and it is a mega rocket it is a huge again amazing piece of technology uh, and it's taken a long time to to build it, and uh, the rocket, from memory, cost about one point eight billion dollars. Whoops! <laughs> yes, me. Yeah. Wow! Because it's new. It's it's a combination of old and new technology, and there are. It's not just the rocket itself. It's the platform that it, that it launches from as well. The the launch mount. It's the people yeah, that work behind it. Exactly. It's, that um, it's all it's, gets in the mail. Yep. Yep. And it's NASA working in collaboration with all kinds of space agencies, you know, the European Space Agency, JAXA, the Japanese Space Agency. There's all these different collaborations. Um, and the vehicle itself, the, the space launch system, is a system. It's a combination of different uh, modules that have been made by different companies and put together. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, uh, um, I mean, the, the second stage um, engine um, that pushes the, space, the Orion spacecraft is a European um, system, like device, so, or vehicle. 
So it's pretty amazing what, what they've put together. Um, so a bit of a profile of the mission itself, and I'm just using NASA's website to help here. So uh, Artemis 1 will be the first integrated test of NASA's deep space exploration systems. This is the combination of the Orion, Orion spacecraft, which includes the Orion capsule where human beings will eventually, or astronauts will eventually travel in, the space launch system, which is the rocket, uh, and the ground systems at Kennedy Space Center. So this is the whole system. The first in a series of increasingly complex missions. So, so this is the easy one, even though it's really complex, because it's actually going to get more and more complex as they go. This is the, the easy one, although it's not easy at all, um, because the second mission will have people on it and will have a different purpose. And, and the rocket will be a different configuration. So oh, um, this is, be, yeah. yeah. So this is an uncrewed test flight. And it will provide a foundation for human deep space exploration and demonstrate uh, NASA's capability to extend human existence to the moon and then beyond. And so that the implication there is oh, Mars wow. to start with. There we go. Yeah. Yep. That was good. Yeah. So during the flight, the spacecraft will launch on the most powerful rocket in the world. And that's true until Starship is ready. This is the most powerful rocket. The Starship will be more powerful and larger, um, but this is the most powerful rocket to date. So this is why I think it's really co cool to watch because this is a monster mega rocket that they're, that they're launching. Um, it will go further um, than any uh, spacecraft built for humans has ever flown. Uh, it will travel 280,000 miles. I don't know what that is in kilometers <laughs> from Earth. Wow. Um, thousands mm. of miles beyond the moon uh, and over a course of about say it's a uh, they say a four to six week mission so that's variable depending on, on how the outcomes are achieved it'll oh, stay in space it'll be longer oh well okay. no so th okay. this okay. is a whole like a round trip so go to the moon orbit for a couple of days come back to earth and um and recover the capsule and this is to test that the whole thing the whole system works cool yeah that yep. makes sense yeah yep. so um it will yeah stay in space any longer ha um than any ship for astronauts has done without docking to a space station and return home faster, as in speed, and hotter than ever before. So, basically, um, it will launch from Launch Complex 39B, which is uh, NASA's spaceport at Kennedy Space uh, Center in Florida, which is where you see most um, American rocket launches take, uh, happen from. At the moment, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. um, it's designed for missions beyond uh, low Earth orbit, for carrying crew or cargo to the moon and beyond. So this isn't about launching spat satellites into orbit around the Earth, which is what most missions are. This is about taking people and equipment beyond Earth's orbit. So to the moon and beyond. Now, um, I don't know how to translate pounds um, of thrust, so I'll just use what's here, but it says it will produce um, into tons. I don't know how to do it, but it says 8.8 .8 million pounds of thrust during liftoff. And that's a lot. Um, that's and a lot. Ascent oh. to, um, uh, and ascent to, lo to a loft vehicle weighing, it says nearly 6 million pounds to, uh, to orbit. So it propelled, yeah, this is, yeah, this is a, a heavy, a heavy hey, rocket. This is a heavy, yeah. heavy rocket. Yeah, very yeah. heavy. Yeah. Um, and it can carry tons and tons of gear in, into space too, which is really cool. Um, so it'll be pro propelled by a pair of, um, of boosters. So the boosters are those, um, those tall white rockets on the side. Um, and, and four RS-25 engines. Now, these are actually the engines that were used on the space shuttle as well. So they have, they have a lot of leftover space shuttle engines, so they've repurposed them and re, you know, refurbished and renewed them so that they can be used. And the idea of that was to save money. Now, I'm not sure of how course. much money they actually saved considering the cost blowouts they <laughs> yeah. had, but, but that so at least fun. was the intention anyway. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So it will. Um, so after it launches, um, it will it will hit you know max Q, which is the highest amount of pressure on the rocket, within about ninety seconds, and then after that, once it gets through max Q, those those giant white those giant boosters will then be jettisoned. And if you look at the um, at the what's it called the shuttle launches, it's a very similar thing where the where the boosters would then be jettisoned, um, and also the service uh, module panels. And the launch abort system. These will um, these will all be um, all be jettisoned. The launch abort system is if during launch there's a problem, the uh, the capsule uh, carrying people carrying the astronauts will separate and will uh, basically like a, a rocket on top literally propels it away from any danger or, or anything else like that as well. So it's like an emergency system to save to save people's lives. The abort system, but once they get high enough, the abort system isn't needed, so it's jettisoned. Uh, and, that, and then also the core stage as well, um, which is that giant, uh, the core stage is a giant, that giant tank full of fuel that the engines are attached to. So once, once it gets uh, high enough, the core stage, um, the engines will shut down and the core stage will then separate. And then it's just the Orion spacecraft with the, um, with the 
It's called an inter, interim cryogenic propulsion stage. So this is an, a smaller rocket that will um, in, w- um, with a couple of engines or one engine that will then boost the Orion spacecraft into orbit of the Earth. Cool. So, oh, wow. Yep. So then it will, um, it will get into orbit. And then from orbit, it will then move uh, beyond the, the highest uh, satellites that orbit the Earth and prepare to do what's called a TLI or a translunar injection where it basically sets course for the moon. So um, during that time, so once, the, once it's separated in the space, that once the spacecraft has separated from the, um, from the propulsion module, the propulsion module will then deploy about 13 different cube satellites. So it's actually going to... Oh, cool. Yeah, which is really cool. So... Yeah, uh, all these little yeah, satellites pop, popping yeah. out. And there's catch a video it, of what it looks it. like, cool. and it's really cool. So the, um, the Orion space uh, craft will fly away, and the, the engine stage the, um, will then, at that point, launch its little satellites. So I wanted to briefly talk about what these satellites are. They're called CubeSats, which means smaller, they're like small satellites. Some can be like the size of a microwave, you know, that, that, and, and a little bit larger. Um, but I'll, I'll just quickly go through what each of them are um, without going into too much detail, because actually each of, one, each of these is a science segment on its own, to be honest, as well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so uh, here's a breakdown of, of, of these 13 CubeSats. Argo, Argo Moon is designed by Argo Tech um, and coordinated by the Italian Space Agency. It's designed to image the interim cryogenic propulsion stage, so that second stage that it's just launched itself from, uh, for mission data and historical records. It will demonstrate technologies necessary for a small spacecraft to maneuver and operate near a propulsion stage. BioSentinel is an astrobiology mission that will use yeast to detect, measure, and compare the impact of deep space radiation on living organisms over long durations. Yeah, yeast. Yep. So basically exposing yeast to radiation, to space radiation. That's pretty much what it is. Okay. Um, okay. Yep. To see what kind of effect it has on, on, human, uh, on, on human bodies or on living living things anyway. Oh, living things. So we, okay. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. Makes sense. Um, the next one is the CUSP mission, CubeSat for Solar Particles, designed by the Southwest Research Institute. It will study the dynamic particles and magnetic fields that stream from the sun and as a proof of concept for the feasibility of a network of stations to track space weather. Uh, Equilius, uh, which I don't have the... Do I? No, it doesn't say what that stands for. Anyway, this is a Japanese uh, satellite um, that was created by JAXA and the University of Tokyo. It will image Earth's plasmosphere to study the radiation environment around the Earth while demonstrating low thrust maneuvers for trajectory control in space between Earth and the Moon. And yes, that was a mouthful. Um, <laughs> Luna, Luna Ice Cube. No, we're not launching a celebrity into space. There is one called Luna Ice Cube. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say. Yeah. Oh. It reminds me of the, um, of the lyrics from um, Pretty Fly for a White Guy. Pretty where Fly he, White Guy. He, yeah. um, he tried to buy Ice Cube, but he bought Vanilla Ice. Instead. Vanilla Ice. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Anyway, um, that's going back to a long time ago. Uh, anyway, so <laughs> Lunar Ice Cube is a lunar orbiter, so it's going to orbit the moon, uh, and it will search for additional evidence of lunar water ice from a low lunar orbit. Now, the water and ice on the moon is really important because that can be converted into a fuel, a fuel source for launches from the moon later on in the future. Oh so, wow! So the moon could might become a, a petrol station or a gas petrol station, depending on how you set. Gas yeah. station or something. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I hope right. the prices okay. there are cheaper than they are on Earth. I just want to say that much. Oh man, um, I can imagine it will be so expensive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what? Five hundred dollars a liter? What? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Google Maps. Yeah. What if I've got my Woolworths discount card? Yeah. <laughs> how many points do I get for that? Google Space Maps. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Next up, yeah. Next stop. Turn left the at the next moon. Yeah, that's right. Turn yeah. left at the moon. Wow. Yeah. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. I like that. I like yeah, that. it's a good one. Um, the next one is called Lunar H Map or the Lunar Polar Hydrogen Mapper. A lunar orbiter designed at Arizona State uh, University. It will map hydrogen within craters near the lunar south pole tracking depth and distribution of hydrogen-rich compounds like water. It will use a neutron detector, which sounds so Star Trek, to measure the energies say, of... Yeah, yeah, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it will measure the energies of neutrons that interacted with the material on the lunar surface. Its mission is planned to last 60 days and perform 141 orbits of the moon. The, uh, the Near-Earth Asteroid Scout is a proof of concept of a controllable CubeSat solar sail spacecraft Say that ten times fast. Yeah, it's been capable, ten times, yeah, yeah. Wow. Ca- um, capable oh. of encountering near-Earth asteroids. Observations will be achieved through a close ten kilometers flyby 
of asteroids and using a high resolution science grade monochromatic camera to measure the physical properties of a near earth asteroid. A variety of potential targets would be identified based upon launch date, time of flight, and rendezvous velocity. Now, because pronouncing things, it's I've already done a good job and it, it just wants to make sure I can do this. Omo Tanashi, it's called. Now, this, of course, is an anagram for something. I have no idea. However, this one is really cool. I love this. This is designed by JAXA, so it's another Japanese one. It's a lander probe uh, to study lunar, the lunar radiation environment. So this is a small lunar lander. So they're going to land this on the moon, which I want to follow this mission. I want to know all about this one. Um, and then, yeah, and then we'll land on the moon and basically study radiation there, which is cool. Um, now, Lunir, or Lune IR, is a spacecraft designed by Lockheed Martin to fly by the moon and collect surface spectro spectroscopy and thermography. And Lunar Flashlight, cool name, I love this one, is a lunar orbiter, so it's going to orbit the moon, and it will seek exposed water ice and map its concentration uh, in the one to two kilometer scale within the within the permanently shadowed regions of the lunar south pole it was one of three cubesat missions to miss the integration window to fly an artemis one but it will need to find an alternative ride to the moon so ah, uh, this one i thought this was going with artemis i have to look that one up that's all right oh, oh okay and oh, um okay. then there were three remaining slots which were opened as a competition um, the competition was called NASA's Cube Quest Challenge, and the winners were announced by Ames Research Center um, in 2017. So the competition was to contribute to opening a deep space exploration to non-government spacecraft, and the winners were... Drumroll! <laughs> <laughs> uh, Team Miles will demonstrate long-distance communications while in heliocentric orbit and show low-thrust trajectory control techniques by employing a hybrid ion thruster. It was designed by Fluid and Reason, uh, LLC, Tampa, Florida. So we've got that. Yeah, we've got that one. Um, CIS Lunar Explorers will demonstrate the viability of water electro electrolysis, propulsion, and interplanetary optical navigation to, uh, to orbit the moon. It was designed by Cornell University. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, Ithaca, New York. It was one of three CubeSat missions to miss the integration window to fly an Artemis 1 and will also need to find its own way to the moon. Oh, so sad. All right. Um, oh, no. <laughs> and Earth Escape Explorer will demonstrate long distance communications while in heliocentric orbit. It was designed by the University of Colorado uh, Boulder. And sadly, it missed its integration to Artemis 1 and will also need to find its own way to the moon as well. But these were, these were what's intended. Um, so the majority of those are going to be launched on, on Artemis 1. And no doubt the... Um, the when you watch the mission they'll go through these profiles in a lot more detail than what we've done here so i'll just finish the mission overview so that that's uh so the that um the uh the cryogenic uh, engine system will then you know it's launched those um those satellites it's out of the picture and now it's all up to the the orion spacecraft so the orion spacecraft will then go to the moon and orbit it um so to be propelled by what's called a service module which is like a an engine module, like another vehicle. Um, and this will supply the propulsion um, and power and as well as the, um, the air and water for astronauts on future missions. So they're testing everything now to see what the conditions are like for astronauts in the, um, in the, um, in the, the capsule, the Orion capsule, which is the part where humans live in. Gotcha. So it's going to be, be inside. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yep. Yeah. That makes sense. Yep. So, um, Orion will pass through the Van Allen radiation belts. Fly plus. Van Allen. Pass. Sorry. Yeah, no, Van no, this is different. <laughs> yeah, it's no, a bit no, different. That's a different yeah. one. Different. Yeah. Sorry, boat. My, my, my bad. My bad. Might as well jump. <laughs> yeah, sorry, yeah. Definitely, right. definitely will. <laughs> that's the music they have to play in the capsule as it launches, I reckon. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, it'll, uh, so, it'll fly past the global positioning system in orbit of Earth, which is in, in one of the highest orbits. Um, and it, to talk to Mission Control in Houston, Orion will switch from NASA's tracking and data relay satellite system and communicate through the Deep Space Network, which I love the name of that, by the way. Um, <laughs> Deep so Space for, Network. Yeah, yep. so this is the, the <laughs> network that I think um, probes and things in deep space use to connect, to, to communicate with Earth. So Orion's going to be using that as well. From here, Orion will continue to demonstrate its unique design and net to navigate, communicate, and operate in deep space environment. It will then make its out outbound trip to the moon, which will take several days. And in this time, engineers are going to evaluate the spacecraft systems 
um, and then make any corrections to its trajectory or anything else that needs to happen uh, on Just the in way. Case, yeah. Yep. 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 So Orion will fly 100 kilometers above the surface of the moon, and then use the moon's What's gravitation. The That's um, yep. pretty close, is it? It's, it's, it's close. close yeah. I mean, you'll be able to see close. the moon. I mean, you'd have a pretty good view of the moon. Like, yeah. Um, yeah, and then use, I mean, and it's a big body in space, so 100 kilometers means it will look quite large too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so you pretty you get some decent views of it. Uh, and then it will use the moon's gravitational force to propel Orion into a new deep retrograde or opposite orbit about 70,000 kilometers from the moon. Um, yeah, and I'll let Caroline explain retrograde orbits because I was reading about it and, you know, I've learned a few things, but Caroline can do it better. Um, this, yeah, so the spacecraft will stay in orbit for about six days to collect data and allow mission controllers to assess the performance of the spacecraft. During this period, Orion will travel in a direction around the moon, retrograde from the direction the moon travels to the Earth. So I think that means opposite, the retrograde thing, but leave it at that. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> six days would have then passed by. And then it will return to Earth. So for the return trip, it will do another close flyby. So remember, it was 70,000 kilometers away. It will travel to about uh, about another, again, 100 kilometers approximately from the moon's surface. surface. Um, and it says the spacecraft will use another precisely timed engine firing of the European-provided module, uh, um, the space uh, module, uh, with the moon's gravity to accelerate back towards Earth. This maneuver will set the spacecraft on a trajectory to Earth's outer uh, Earth to enter the atmosphere at twenty five thousand miles per hour, or in Australian me. language, eleven kilometers per second. So this is fast. This is really fast. Wow. Um, temperatures okay. temperatures exceeding. Uh, I'll do both measurements here: five thousand degrees Fahrenheit or two thousand seven hundred and sixty degrees Celsius. Um, and so this is quite fast and quite hot. So it actually does have a very a very advanced heat shield to be able to enter the atmosphere when it when it does return to Earth because there'll be a lot of friction and create a lot of heat. This thing is going to burn as it comes in. Um, so after about three weeks and a total distance uh, of about 1.3 million miles, that would be the total travel distance that it's done, the mission will end with a test of Orion's capability to return safely to the Earth as the spacecraft makes the precision landing with eyesight recovery within eyesight recovery of the um, recovery ship off the coast of Baja, California. I hope I said that correctly. Uh, and I if I'm Baja. down... Is it Baja? Baja? I don't know if it's Baja or Baja. Someone, all right. um, <laughs> so, someone will correct us. Yep. Uh, either way. Um, I was trying to sound like I knew what I was talking about there. So, <laughs> <laughs> following splashdown, Orion will remain powered for a period of time as, it, as divers from the US Navy and operations team uh, will then send small boats out to recover the ship. Uh, they'll inspect the craft, look for hazards, hook it up to um, the tow lines, and then a boat will recover it and bring the spacecraft home. And that will be the end of Artemis 1, paving the way to the moon and, and beyond, which is very exciting. Wow. Yeah. Cool, 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 yep. cool, cool, cool. So what this means for the future is uh, they'll then take the steps to build um, another, I think they would be building it already, another SLS or space launch system, um, this time with, the, with um, humans in mind to send astronauts to the moon. Um, and then they'll begin testing it and getting it ready. And it says the second flight, which I believe is slated at the moment for 2024. Don't quote me on that. Um, but wow, it'll take crew... not too far away. Yeah. It's not too far away, no. Uh, it'll take crew on a different trajectory and test Orion's critical systems with humans on board. And they say that they'll, they'll evolve the systems. Um, so um, SLS's uh, mission will be to send equipment and people to the moon. And it will be able. It will be able to. Um, in its final configuration, it will be able to carry forty-five metric tons, which is a lot. That's that's, that's a lot, lot for space. That, yeah, a lot of space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, very very exciting. And later on in the future, future exploration missions with crew on board, uh, will assemble and dock with uh, the Lunar Gateway, which is a space station that's planned for lunar orbit. And uh, using the gateway, that's how people are going to land on the moon. So they'll dock with the gateway then go into the spacecraft that's at the gateway already and use that to land on the moon and come back. And the spacecraft, um, the spacecraft that will be the, uh, the, the lunar lander and then take off from the moon and come back to the space station is Starship, SpaceX's Starship. So there's a moon variant that's being designed for that as well, which is so cool, so exciting. Oh, yeah. Cool, cool. Yeah. So Gateway is almost like a, uh, what's it? It's like the an ISS. For us. Yeah, like, like, it is like, like an airport. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, not airport, yeah. sorry, spaceport. Like spaceport, spaceport, yeah. And then, and they come yeah. Sweet. Yeah, wow. so it'll be a, cool. a couple of modules to start with, and they'll, they'll send expansion modules to make it bigger uh, as they go along. 
you know, it's like when you buy a board game and yeah, you know, you buy a board game and it's, um, you know, you've got the, you've got the, the core set, but then suddenly you've got to buy the expansions <laughs> to make it more fun. And that's what, that's what the Lunar Gateway, so the ISS well, is basically like, yeah. At least it doesn't cost us like billions of dollars, Lizzie. So it should be okay. Yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yep. All right. So very excited for that mission and can't wait to see what all of you, yeah. Watch it, people. Watch it. In Australia, it will be on, I look at my calendar. It's Monday the 29th in Australia at 10.33 PM, which is actually pretty decent because these things happen at crazy times normally. And I am so glad it is not happening during the day when I'm at work, because if it's in a class, students are going to be watching SLS. I'm sorry, that's what they're going to do. Yeah, that's education. And, and why I'm excited, not just because it's a big flamey rocket, but also this is history. This is, this is, um, this is a first, all right? A first a rocket of this type. Um, a first in the sense that this is not just a moon rocket, but this is about going into deep space, the moon and beyond. Um, this, this is a first because this is the, the furthest a, a spacecraft has been from Earth that's designed to come back to Earth again. So there are a lot of a lot of important firsts in this and very exciting. So looking forward to that. Yeah. We should live stream watch it. No, I'm kidding. No, we won't do that. Because it's just been me going, oh my gosh, oh my God, look at that. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. No, let's not do that. All right. So, um, yeah. All right. So there we are, Lita. Let's move on um, because we're, we are wow. uh, way over I don't time. Know, what do you I got do? excited in the first segment. So let's do a quick wow. one. Let's move on and okay. talk about entertainment. I don't know where you get your delusions, laser brain. It's not what we came here to do. No. I it's what I'm going to do. I have a plan. You've got a plan. I have... We'll do this in five minutes. Let's, well, all right, no, because yep. someone's going to time us. We'll do this quickly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> quickly, yeah. Lido, what's been entertaining you recently? Uh, besides our um, trip to Queensland. Yeah, um, to bring that up, didn't you? Thanks. Oh, yep. sorry, did I have to? Yeah. <laughs> yep. That's right. Um, been watching um, Stranger Things. Oh, been of course. Watching that. I think I almost finished this season now. I think there's only eight, eight episodes. Right. So we're Season four? That. Season four. Yeah. yeah. Very good. Very good. Yeah, I we're yet totally to watch it at home. So we have to, yeah. You recommend it? totally recommend it yeah. this is a great series now i've heard it's a bit scarier than previous seasons it can be yeah, yeah. it is much scarier sadly mm. uh, don't let, let the kids watch it yeah, if you're planning to watch it with your five-year-old don't <laughs> definitely <laughs> not definitely not yeah. um so we're watching so i started watching actually well, Lindsay, i forgot to tell you i've been watching expanse again i watched the first episode oh, again i, I love i love the I, expanse i know I, i've been watching Best the sci-fi first... series ever so I'm that's, getting that's my that. big call i love that. it I loved yeah. it because I was watching the first uh, episode, but I kept on getting stopped. Yeah. And I had to rewind, stop again. Yeah. But I just started again today. I mean, yesterday, today, or yeah. yesterday, whatever. And it was good. It yeah. was great story, so great fun. characters. Yeah. Um, really you know, A couple of flaws here and there, but I, I love it. Uh, yeah. yeah no, it's, it's so good. It's really interesting. Yeah. Um, and oh, what was the other one I was going to Oh, and we watched a new one on Amazon Prime called um, The Terminalists. So it's got um, Chris With Pratt Star-Lord. in it. <laughs> yes, Star Lord. Star Lord. Star Lord. No, yeah, Chris Pratt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, with Chris Pratt. So, yes. Yeah. It was. It was a good. Uh, the first episode was good. Is yeah, this a military so, drama yeah. or something? Or yeah, I yeah, haven't so, seen it. I've only heard a couple of things about it. So very quickly, he's yeah. part of a Navy SEAL team that was meant to take out a terrorists, and apparently they were ambushed. Okay. And he's getting blamed for the ambush. Things are going happening in the background. He's okay. sort of um losing. His ability to remember. Yeah. Sometimes people say, "Oh, this happened two days before." Okay. I can't remember. He just feels like I'm. I'm just all the guy yesterday. So yeah, that, it's a good, interesting um, show, and it's a bit of a different for for Chris Pratt. Yeah. Um. You, know, you see him in comedies and you know being funny and everything, but this time he's a bit serious. It's it's okay. You, you get yeah. used to him being serious. Yeah, he, 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 well, I'm waiting for him to say a little gag or something. <laughs> yeah. But no, it's all good. It's all, yeah, oh, yeah. interesting. Okay, cool, cool. All right, thanks for that. Um, I'll do a brief one. So mine mine does have a spiritual angle to it as well. So um, uh, recently, uh, so 
the, the way this works is every now and then I'll take my laptop into the living room, my work laptop, and I'll just do a couple of like, just the easy tasks, not the ones that require a lot of con- like concentration. And I'll fire up the TV, I'll put on Amazon music and I'll just pick some mu- uh, pick something to listen to, whatever, a uh, combination of whatever it might be. Um, for some reason, I just started listening to, to Matt Ma. He's a Catholic musician. Um, I've listened to his music before. I've seen him live a couple of times at World Youth Day and, and the Australian Catholic Youth Festival. And I love his music because... I feel like when I listen to his music, it's like this, this is a musician who knows his theology. He's obviously done, uh, he's obviously studied and his music reflects that really well. And I was listening to one of his songs called Alive Again. And by the way, my entertainment is, you know, my pick is listening to Matt Ma music. So just putting that out there. But the reason why it stuck out with me is like, I just had this great spiritual buzz. He was singing a song called Alive Again. And I, I remembered I, again, it's like, oh, wait a minute. This is St. Augustine. He's, the, the lyrics are the words of St. Augustine. Is it, is, yeah, St. Augustine wrote uh, his, his Confessions, which was like a series of books uh, or a, a one book with a series of you know, chapters in it and whatever. Um, and his Confessions, he talked about um, his conversion back to God. How he, you know, he, he talked about his sinful life, how he had abandoned God for, you know, for whatever was created in the world. And, uh, but then how he found God again. And the thing is, though, um, Listen to the way he says it. And this is the lyrics. This is what Matt Maher based his song on was this, right? He says, Late have I loved you, O beauty ever ancient, ever new. Late have I loved you. You were within me, but I was outside. And it was there that I searched for you. In my unloveliness, I plunged into the lovely things which you created. You were with me, but I was not with you. Created things kept me from you. Yet if they had not been in you, they would not have been at all. You called, you shouted, and you broke through my deafness. You flashed, you shone, and you dispelled my blindness. You breathed your fragrance on me. I drew in breath, and now I pant for you. I have tasted you, now I hunger and thirst for more. You touched me, and I burned for your peace. And I just had... I just had the biggest like chill of, wow, that's amazing. You know, just, so that's what I was listening to the song and I Googled it straight. It's like, yeah, that's St. Augustine. So I Googled it and, and Isabel was there. Like, and I said, like, oh my gosh, Isabel, you've got to listen to this. And, um, and I read the whole thing to her like that, like there's more, there's like more paragraphs to this, which are amazing, but we're too long for the podcast. Um, yeah. So uh, yes, St. Augustine's confessions are quite entertaining. <laughs> that way. Yeah. Yeah, cool, uh, cool, and also, cool, cool. and also, very quickly, every now and then, when I've got time, I've I've continued with the Xbox. I've got it fired up, and now I've been playing Batman: Arkham Origins, and it's actually really cool. It's like earlier Batman, like really gritty Batman who still has a bit of anger in him, you know. So he's a bit a bit harsher in the way that he you know, sure, yeah. fights crime. Um, cool, 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 cool. But yeah, and the poor guy, everyone's against him. <laughs> <He's>, <laughs> everyone's got in for him. Yeah, but, wow. but yeah, but fun game, a lot of fun. Anyway. I cool, wish I had more cool, time cool, to play cool, cool. it. Wish I had a lot more time to play it. <laughs> You'll find, right. man. You'll find yeah. time. You'll find time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, maybe if I go on a um, uh, holiday to Queensland, I'll play it there. Oh, of course. But, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Wi-Fi is, man, the internet's great over there. So there's yeah. no problem. <laughs> ah, pro tip. There you go. All right. So, um, Let's wrap it up there. So before we finish up, we want to thank you all for joining us for episode 82 of the Catholics of Oz. Before we go, we'd like to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to share the show. So we want to thank today, Mary H, Stephen C, Liz W, Teresa J, and Wylan F. And I want to thank Don Bettinelli as well for providing, providing the name of patrons. I forgot to ask him, but he remembered. So thankfully he gave it to us before the show. So good one, Dom. Thank you. Um, through their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give, they make it possible for the Catholics of Oz and all of the other shows on StarQuest to continue. So you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. And we'd love to know your thoughts about the topics that we've discussed uh, in today's show. You can send us feedback by visiting sqpn.com slash Oz, spelled O-Z, where you can also find the links and show notes for today, the things we talked about in today's episode. Don't forget, StarQuest has a newsletter, The Insiders Club. It will tell you what's coming up in future episodes of other shows, sqpn.com slash about slash newsletter. And you can interact with us and others on Discord, sqpn.com slash Discord. Join the community. It's lots of fun. I love the new memes channel that's been put up there. People just sharing random memes. <laughs> memes. Yeah, it's great fun. <laughs> They're all pretty um, good. Yeah. yeah, but lots of new channels as, as, um, as people who are part of the community start to you know join in. They start to request different channels. And if Dom can do it, um, if it's worthwhile having, he puts it in. So the memes channel is a new one. 
good for a bit of a laugh every now and then. And you can also find our, our shows uh, from SQPN on Facebook uh, at facebook.com slash StarQuest Media or on Twitter, which is at SQPN. And we have our own Catholics of Oz Facebook page, facebook.com slash Catholics of Oz, where you can join us and talk about our episodes there too. And if you like good old email, you can email us at Catholics of Oz at SQPN.com. Lino, thank you so much for joining me for episode 82 of the Catholics of Oz. It has been totally awesome and spacey. I don't know what you're going to title this um, episode, Lizzie, but I don't know, Soapbox. Get space, off your Soapbox. Space. <laughs> soapbox <laughs> in space. <laughs> soapbox is in space. <laughs> Good about that. Good about that. Yeah. But, uh, thank you, guys, and take care, and God bless. Excellent. And once again, I'm Lindsay Sant. Thank you so much for joining us for episode 82 of the Catholics of Oz on StarQuest.